Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Economic Strategy Group's webinar, Securing Our Economic Future, Policies to Strengthen the Middle Class and Address Climate Change. I'm Hank Paulson, Chairman of the Economic Strategy Group, which is a program of the Aspen Institute, which convenes uh, a broad group of, of, of leaders across business, uh, academia, public policy to surface evidence-based solutions to address with a goal of addressing some of the some of the most challenging problems that the US economy faces and to strengthening and here I put a emphasis on bipartisan bipartisan relationships and friendships among uh, future leaders and, uh, and and current leaders in uh, economic policy. Now, today's program is a culmination of a year of, uh, I think, some uh, sub, uh, substantial accomplishments and some hard work. Uh, and I really want to thank the authors of the report. I want to thank the, uh, the uh, members. I want to uh, thank the staff, because what we're going to do today is we're going to have a panel, uh, two panels, and we're going to roll out a, uh, a, a book, which was a culmination of, the, of this year of work. So thank you all. And now I'm going to turn it over to my good friend and co-chair, Erskine Bowles. Thank you, Hank. Uh, it's always a joy and an honor for me to be with you, old friend. And good afternoon to each of you out there in the virtual world. It's a beautiful day here in Charlotte, I can tell you that. And we thank you for enjoying, joining us this afternoon. As Hank pointed out, each year our bipartisan group from across the business world, academia, and the public policy arena studies a different set of policy issues, which we believe are of critical importance to our nation's well being. In turn, we commission a, a group of leading economic experts from around our country to prepare papers for us, papers that will help us understand what the latest research on these issues is. And then we come together to discuss these issues and debate how to apply our findings to current public policy. This year, we made a decision back in January to focus on the economics of the middle class and the global climate challenge. Clearly, we made these decisions to focus on these particular topics before America was struck by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has, gosh, so severely impacted the health and economic well-being and security of millions of Americans. This horrid, and I can't overstress that word, horrid pandemic has laid bare the understand under, underlying economic insecurity facing so many of our fellow Americans while also reinforcing the need to build back better and strengthen the robust and thriving middle class. Our choices of topics this year was also made prior to this year's unprecedented climate events, which also reinforces the importance of our addressing this critical challenge. The significant problems facing the middle class and those produced by global climate challenges predated the pandemic, and they will be here long after the pandemic is gone, unfortunately. But the pandemic clearly has brought forward the need for America to rebuild an economy that is more secure and better insulated from the risk of the 21st century. But to do that, as we all know, we need to better understand the nature of these challenges and to learn which policy responses offer the best chances of effectively addressing them. That is what we are here to do today. I can't think of another point in my lifetime where bold, creative public policy ideas were more urgently needed. I think we've got an outstanding panel of experts to address these topics today. So without further ado, let me turn off this over to the Economic Strategy Group's fabulous, and I do mean fabulous, Director, Melissa Kearney. Thank you, 
Thank you very much, Erskine and Hank. Um, so I'm going to start with our first panel of the day, and this takes up the issue of middle class economic security or lack thereof. And this is an issue that continues to capture a great deal of attention from politicians, policymakers, and the press. There seems to be no shortage of stories coming out in the newspapers or tank reports talking about the vanishing middle class and the economic burdens on these households. So what we did uh, last year, as Erskine alluded to, is we reached out to some of the most data-driven, rigorous, careful scholars who have studied these issues, and we asked them to write reports for us on particular elements of middle-class economic security. So I'm delighted that we have three of those authors here with us today. Bruce Sasserdot, Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. Adam Looney, Visiting Professor in the Department of Finance at the University of Utah and Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. And Kathy O'Regan, Professor of Public Policy and Planning at NYU's Wagner School. We're also very fortunate to have Ben Harris here as a panelist to comment on these papers. Ben is the executive director of the Kellogg Public Private Initiative and a former senior advisor to the Biden campaign. So the papers that these authors have written are all available in our new volume being released today. So I encourage everybody to go to our website and either download a free copy of that book or go ahead and order a free hard copy of the book. Um, there's a lot to talk about in these papers and the other six excellent chapters in that volume. So I'm going to dive right in with questions for our panelists so we can cover the substance. Um, and in the meantime, to folks in the audience, if you have questions, please submit them to us in the Q&A and I will come to your questions toward the end of our hour together. Okay, I am going to start with you, Bruce. Um, you directly take on the claim that the middle class is vanishing. And indeed, the title of your paper even suggests that those claims are exaggerated. So why don't you explain to us your main findings and how you come to that conclusion? Sure, yeah, thanks, Melissa. And I'm gonna share screen to just try to make this point in a couple of slides if I can. Um, let me see if I can get it. Well, of course it doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want it to use a show, that's fine. Let me just, let me just, let me just flip through these. Um, so, so Melissa said it very well when she made the point that there's a lot of angst that the middle class is disappearing. And I think that where this is coming from is that economists and therefore journalists have really focused on a couple of facts. Like there's a big rise in income inequality over the last 30 years. And at the same time, there's been a lot of uh, uh, jobs that we, tip, that we often associate with middle, middle class jobs disappearing. So I think people have then jumped to the conclusion that, oh, the middle class is disappearing and there's only rich and poor people in this country. Um, it turns out that that's not at all true, and it's, there's actually a much more boring story um, going on. Uh, if you look at the income distribution, uh, I've got 1980 here in blue and 2017 in red, where all the dollars are updated to, to 2017. And you, know, you can see, of course, the purple is where the two overlap. And really what's been going on income, household income-wise is that um, there's been a move of households to the upper end of the distribution and kind of we're losing mass uh, uh, somewhat in the lower parts. And so things are spreading out and people are getting, households are getting richer, but there's not like a complete hollowing out when you look at the overall picture. Um, now, a lot of people ask me about uh, how this might vary by race. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a good news, bad news story. I guess, surprisingly, black white gaps in sort of membership in the middle class that's shown on the uh, this chart here have really not changed in 40 years, which is kind of shocking. Um, and this is consistent with some other things you'll see in the book. Um, for example, for a black household, the probability that they land in the middle class is something like 56%, and that's barely moved uh, since 1980 and 1990. Um, and they have their same, the same high probability of being in the lowest quintile of income. Uh, so, the, the good news, I guess there's been e kind of equal growth uh, for both black and white households. And there's been on average growth for, mo for most groups, which I think is a point that gets missed because we're so focused on the inequality of, of growth. Um, 
Let me, um, and clearly there has been growth in inequality. I don't want to uh, uh, understate that. And a, a typical amount would be something like what you see in this chart here, where like, if you look at, at men's wages in 1980, people at the 80th percentile earned 50% more than men um, at, the, at the 80th earned 50% more than those at the 50th. And that rose to, to uh, 60% more. Uh, you know, by, 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 by 2004. Now, job loss, there's been a lot of, of uh, hollowing out of the job distribution. Overall, though, that, that means that the clerical jobs and high school production jobs have uh, disappeared. But if you look at the whole economy, there's actually been gain, there's been mostly gain in high school jobs. It's only when you look at the non-college educated where you see growth in the fraction of jobs that are, that are low-skilled jobs. Um, and finally, let me just end on this. Um, consumption is really, in some sense, one of the things we care about the most. And if you look at, if you use uh, consumption data for people in the bottom 20th, the top 20th, or, or the middle class, there's, and I put this on a log scale, so don't be, don't be deceived by that. It's true that the people in the green line have much, much higher consumption. Uh, than, than people in the red line, which is the middle class. But they kind of move, they move somewhat in tandem with a bit of a widening out. And encouragingly, there's, there, is, there is growth in consumption for the people in the, uh, the lowest uh, 20%. They seem to be catching up. And you know, if you look at other, let me look at two other measures just real quick. If you look at the number of cars people own over the years, it's hardly surprising that that's gone up a lot. Um, it's gone up steadily. I shouldn't say it's gone up a lot. Um, what has gone up a lot is the likelihood that your adult, your young adult child is in college. And that's been growing for all income groups. And so there's a lot, there is more variation, but there's also a lot of good news and a, a lot of uh, lifting of all boats on average. Um, I, will, I will come back to this, but there's a lot of variation around these averages, but th th this is what the averages are trying to tell us. Thanks. This is, um, you know, certainly a more optimistic picture, I think, than the typical narrative that we read about. Um, but your your paper does make it clear that it's not all rosy for the middle class. And even before the onset of the ongoing pandemic, there were signs of distress. So can you take another minute to just give us the, on the other hand, and highlight some of the ways that the middle class is struggling? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of low lights too. And I think those have gotten appropriate attention in the media. So, so I think the the most worrisome parts are that it's very hard. There's two. There's two very worrying parts that I would highlight. Um, it's very hard to be in the upper middle class now if you don't have uh, some form of, of of designated skill or college education. And along with that, we now know, and this is something that a lot of us on this uh, panel have worked on, that just any skill won't do. There are plenty of college degrees and college enrollments that actually will not benefit you. Um, and so I think, I think those trends are worrying and it's certainly no guarantee that just simply working hard without a, a sought after skill is, is, going to, is going to land you in the middle class. And, and, and let me just emphasize the point, there is so much in any of these lines, there is so much variation around that. And there are so many people who have lost jobs and have experienced uh, uh, negative shocks. And so we're talking here about the average uh, growth in, in the US. Great, thank you. There's um there's a lot to pack unpack in that, but I do want to move on and, and give um, Adam now a chance to talk about the key findings of his paper. Um, so Adam, you took up the issue of tax and transfers um, of the middle class, and if I repeat back, there's a Pew survey from a few years ago that reported a majority of Americans believe that the federal government does not do enough to help the middle class, and Surely, I think we'd all agree there are lots of calls from politicians across the political spectrum for more help or focus on the middle class. Um, you and your co-authors document something that I think is quite surprising, which is actually that the middle class's share of federal, federal income taxes has fallen and their share of federal transfer payments has been rising. Can you explain how you get to that finding and, and some of the main features of it. I uh, sure. And and so I, uh, you know, in response to though that that I, I have a couple um, facts to highlight. Um, and 
also share my screen if this is going to work. Does that work? Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so thank you for that question. Um, I, I want to start off by by highlighting three uh, observations we make in the paper. Um, the first is that uh, federal policy does a lot to support the middle class through social insurance and transfer programs, um, and also by reducing the tax burden they face. Uh, second, the income tax, uh, sorry, the income support that the federal government provides to households, it's increased over time. And so the after tax, after transfer income of middle class households has actually grown faster uh, than what those households have earned in the market, you know, from their jobs and investments. Uh, and third, going forward, the fiscal support that is that has boosted middle class income growth over the last several decades is going to be harder to sustain in the future. Uh, and to illustrate that first point, uh, this chart shows the average market income per person across the, the income distribution and compares it to the income, their income after tax and after transfers. So for instance, uh, this chart shows that the net effect of federal policy is to reduce the disposable income of households in the top uh, income quintile by about 27%. But in the bottom quintile, it raises the take home pay of those households um, from about $5,000 per person to about $15,000 per person. And then in the middle, for the, the middle 60% of households, uh, which is what in our paper we call the middle class, uh, the net effect of tax and transfer policy is modest. Uh, the average tax burden as a share of market income was about 17% in 2016. Uh, that includes an average tax rate of about 12% from payroll taxes, which is the largest uh, tax burden on the middle class, uh, and only 3.6% from income taxes. Uh, transfers boost their income by about 11%, uh, about half of which is health insurance, uh, which is mostly for families with children. And so on net, the, the effect of federal policy is to reduce the after-tax, after-transfer income uh, of middle-class households by about 7%. Uh, and that net burden is, is historically low. Uh, and it means that the middle class is uh, relieved from at least some of the cost of paying for federal public goods or income support to other groups. Um, and, and the reduction in that net burden over time means that federal policies have boosted the, middle, the income growth of the middle class. Uh, so this next chart shows the, the cumulative growth of real incomes before and after taxes and transfers uh, between 1979 and 2016, the market income of middle class households increased by 39%. Uh, now that's below the average growth of income across all households, which was about 70%. Uh, but when accounting for taxes and transfers, after tax income uh, increased by 57%. So in other words, federal, federal policy changes have helped offset uh, slower than average growth uh, in income that middle class households have experienced over time. Uh, and that's a, a recent phenomenon. So prior to 2000, as you can see on this chart, market incomes and after tax incomes uh, grew at about the same pace. Uh, since 2000, the change partly reflects changes in the budget, um, purchases of defense infrastructure, uh, R&D and interest have declined, spending on social insurance and health and healthcare have increased. Uh, partly it's rising deficits, uh, which allows us uh, allows us to cut taxes on households and also raise their spending. Um, uh, and partly it's, it's other changes in the prog progressivity of the tax system. Uh, for example, through expansions of child-related tax benefits, which have selectively reduced income taxes on low and middle income families. Um, and so looking forward, uh, that boost to growth uh, will be harder to sustain. Uh, the reduction in federal purchases is not going to be uh, replicated uh, and indeed seems likely to be reversed in the case of infrastructure, R&D, uh, you know, clean energy. Uh, and while it's plausible that we can maintain deficits at a high level uh, in order, you know, they can't grow indefinitely. Um, and likewise, I think we can raise taxes on higher income Americans and, and transfer income to lower income households. Uh, and indeed, that's been a very effective way of reducing poverty over the last several decades. Um, 
but it's a policy that becomes more expensive, uh, involves much higher tax rates, and is just less impactful uh, if the beneficiary group is defined, say, to be um, the bottom 80% of households. Yeah, can I, can I pick up on that? Um, I, th I think you make this really interesting and very practical point in the last part of your chapter explaining that we've managed to fund this increased income support and reduce tax burden on middle class households through deficit spending and reduced spending on other public goods like infrastructure and R&D. Now, there are certainly claims out there that, you know, the top 1% is so rich, why can't we just tax them to fund all of this? So can, can you just spend another minute sort of talking about what you see in the data about the practicality of doing that? Sure, I mean, so, so on the one hand, I, I I don't want to diminish the the fact that I, I think it is possible that we can raise taxes on higher income taxpayers. Uh, we've done it in the past. Other countries impose higher tax burdens, uh, and there are certainly practical uh, proposals to raise taxes on, say, the top one percent. Um, and likewise, I, you know, with that kind of revenue, you certainly can reduce poverty and and raise the incomes of you know low income households. I think that the crux of the issue is is the scale of this. Um, um, there are, um, a, you know, a large share of the American population lives in middle class households. Um, they have a relatively high standard of living. Uh, that makes it difficult to, you know, boost the income, the take home pay of that group's um, solely on the um, basis of of taxing the. You know the top one percent, and if you look kind of broadly, how could we replicate uh, a significant increase in the living standards of middle class households using only uh, taxes on the the top one percent? It becomes very difficult in the sense that you know there there isn't uh, a tax rate that is feasible to to implement that. Yeah, you you sort of mentioned the middle class transfer receipt as both anti poverty. And then people sort of towards the top of the middle class that live pretty nice lifestyles. And this relates to something I think Bruce was saying about there's a lot of heterogeneity. So as the definition of the middle class expands to include the 10th to the 80th or 90th percentile, then you know, there starts to be different issues about what we're getting for those transfers. Yes. Okay, so we'll, so we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Kathy, let me turn to you. You actually explicitly focus more on sort of the struggles of, of lower middle class Americans and have highlighted a particular element of economic insecurity, which is housing insecurity. And of course, this is a, an issue that is on tragic full display during the current pandemic. Um, so talk to us about what you and your co-authors have, have written and proposed uh, to address this challenge. You have to unmute. This is why you recommended we leave ourselves unmuted. Um, so, and thanks for making that distinction between the part of the distribution. You really could think about what we're gonna talk about as moderate income households. Um, and let me share my screen as well to have a few slides. Great, I think I'm succeeding in being in the right um, view. So the problem we aim to address is the decades long escalation in housing costs that has outpaced income growth for middle and low income renters. Since 2000, most renters have experienced a decline in their real income net of housing costs, with a nearly 20% decline by 2016 for renters in the bottom quintile of the national income distribution, leaving them with just $400 a month after rent. This leaves millions of households with shrinking resources to pay for other necessities and little ability to accumulate savings. At the same time, there's increasing evidence, including in this volume, that unexpected financial shocks, such as drops in earnings or surprise medical expenses are quite common. Facing those shocks, many moderate or low-income households may lack sufficient savings and liquidity to pay their rent, 
potentially facing eviction or forced moves, events that are costly both to individuals and to society. Research shows that formal evictions significantly increase the risk of homelessness and emergency room use. They also are associated with worse health outcomes, job instability, and poor academic performance among children. Oops, there you go. Good. Let's see if I can get back to the right. Sorry about that. Good. So what we propose is uh, to help low-income renters manage temporary shocks that we create a new federally funded, locally administered rental assistance program to provide short-term emergency funds that can be applied to qualified expenses to help low-income renters remain housed. The program is meant to complement rather than substitute for longer-term and deep rental subsidies and would target households at or below 80% of median income. Even before the pandemic, a few cities offered such types of assistance to prevent homelessness, and research on two such programs found a 76% reduction in the likelihood of homeless shelter use in Chicago, and a 70% decrease in the number of nights families spent in shelters in New York City. We estimate a national program would cost about $4.5 billion in a typical year, and that compares to the 75 billion the US spends annually to subsidize home ownership through various parts of the tax code. Importantly, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, while the proposed program is designed to address financial events in individual renters' lives, the program would also mitigate harm during a common shock, such as a pandemic, much as the unemployment system has been used during COVID-19. Having a pre-existing program would ease scaling to meet large needs in any future crisis. There has been some bipartisan support for emergency rental assistance proposals in recent years. And we think with the pandemic bringing the importance of housing instability into stark relief that this may be the right moment to address this hole in our federal Navy, uh, safety net. Let me stop there. Fabulous, thank you. So you brought up um, the comparison to extended UI during the current pandemic, yeah. which, which raises in my mind a question about your proposal specifically. So, you know, on the one hand, UI just gives people cash. Mm -hmm. And some would say, well, if we're giving people cash, they should be able to pay for the cost they're incurring right now. Yeah. Why do you also need this rental assistance program? Um, and a related question, of course, is, during this pandemic, the way policymakers have opted to deal with this is with eviction moratoriums as opposed to rental assistance yeah. directly. Can you address those two sort of alternative ways of dealing with this issue? Okay. Let's talk. I, I know there have been some discussion in policy debates about and health debates about the Swiss cheese so that the holes, holes don't line up and therefore people don't fall through. This is a Swiss cheese of policy. So during an emergency like we're having right now, UI benefits, cash assistance is a first order best system. We are trying to stabilize people. And the policy we're suggesting is a complement to that that can be used during an emergency and during regular times for people who slip through the cracks. So right now, as we know with unemployment benefits, some people do not receive the benefits. Some of those benefits won't be high enough to keep people stably housed. During an emergency, you also want emergency rental assistance for those people who slip through the cracks and recognize we have an economic crisis going on and we want to also make sure landlords get paid so that we don't have a housing crisis on top of an economic crisis. So the emergency rental system is an important complement during a crisis, an important component of a safety net generally. The eviction moratoriums may keep people housed as the debt grows and they still owe that debt and as the buildings may go under and we have a housing crisis. So we still need resources to patch that part of the current crisis. Great, thank you. Um, okay, Ben, you've been patient and I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts at this point and we gave Ben a lot of homework because we've asked him to comment on all three of these papers. Um, so so Ben, you're, you know, for those on this webinar who don't know Ben, 
you're an economist who is deep into the data and evidence on these things. And you've also uh, been engaged in policy discussions in DC for really a long time. So bringing both of those expertises to this conversation, what's your reaction to these three papers and the ideas they put forward? So first, just let me say a huge thank you, Melissa, for inviting me to be part of this. I mean, what a terrific group. Um, I'm so excited to, to, to be part of this and to comment on these. Uh, you know, so I think someone could read Bruce and Adam's papers and say, so why is there so much angst in the middle class? And um, let me just offer four different thoughts for why, for, for perhaps the disconnect. I don't disagree with anything they've put out there, but I think there's maybe other stories which, which could help explain why so many middle class people appear to feel so stressed and why, the, why it resonates, at least in the political sphere. The first is about trajectories. And so um, the trajectory of wages have changed a lot over the past several decades. So a 25 year old college educated worker in 1940 would see their wages rise fourfold by their 55th birthday. That's a massive increase. So you have all this, these raises that you can expect and these things to be hopeful for. Um, by 1985, that same college educated 25 year old worker would only expect a 2.6 fold increase. Uh, the flattening was even more severe for people without college degrees. So um, a 25 year old worker without a college degree in 1940 uh, would expect a 3.6 uh, fold increase, but uh, a 25 year old worker in 1985 would only have a 1.5 fold increase. So only a 50% increase in real terms over the next 30 years. Um, you know, so the fact that, that people are not expecting their wages to go up as much as they used to might be one of the explanations for why uh, you're sharing you're, you're sharing a lot of this anxiety. A second explanation could be the fact that um, non-essential spending is not growing as fast as costs are. And so Bruce pointed this out in his paper, not in not in the slide, but he had different columns for the growth in essential spending versus total total spending. And you know, from one perspective, yeah, total spending is going up. Why aren't we happier? But there is this notion of the middle class squeeze. And, and by the, the calculations that Bruce did, you can see the middle class, their share of non-essential spending is increasing much more slowly than people at the top. And so the Center for American Progress calls this the, the middle class squeeze. They calculated that non-essential spending fell by about 30% between 2000 and 2012, which coincides with um, the, the calculations that Adam did that show that, you know, there's more stagnation after the turn of the century than before. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to keep, in this is an obvious point, but to keep in mind both costs and incomes when we're thinking about the well-being of the middle class. Um, a third point, and, and Adam mentioned this, and this was mentioned in the Washington Post piece, which highlighted his paper, which is that even though subsidies are increasing to the middle class, a lot of that is going to health. And if the fact, you know, if health costs are going up and the government is paying a larger share of that, does that mean that I'm feeling that much better off? And maybe I'm getting better health care, maybe not, but that probably isn't felt the same way that increase in cash transfers would be felt or increases in, in other in other in-kind benefits. Um, and the fourth point I want to make is just that household composition is a big part of this. And you know, Adam and I have done work on this in the past, decomposing the changes in middle class tax burdens over the past 30 or 40 years. But household composition, uh, composition is changing a lot. So in the United States, uh, we have one of the highest rates of children living in single parent households. There's been a long term decline. Melissa, you know this as, better, as well as anyone in married households with children. Um, and so I think that some of the anxiety might just also be due not just to incomes, but to the way that we're organizing ourselves as families. But overall, just you know, just terrific empirical work here. Um, the last thing I'll say, just on Kathy's on Kathy's paper, um, you know, you've obviously identified an incredibly important area, and uh, it's clear that our system of support for renters was not prepared for the pandemic, and that's true of many, many different types of programs. Forbearance worked really well for homeowners, where you just could say, "Look, I'm going to delay my payments and just pick up where I left off." and the debt more or less stays the same, that obviously doesn't work with renters. And one of the big reasons is for what Kathy said is that we have a lot of uh, uh, small landlords, 48 million people rent from small landlords defined as having 10 units or less. And a lot of these small landlords don't have the cash on hand to sort of front evictions for a long period of time. 
a lot of times they're just making payments on the mortgage and use, you know, basically being a landlord in order to accumulate wealth. So we weren't prepared for this. It's really important that we have a better safety net. One of the biggest problems, and then I'll stop, one of the biggest problems is that um, even though we can allocate dollars, we don't have the infrastructure in place to get the dollars to where they need to go. So Maxine Waters had this $100 billion plan, which was uh, passed in the HEROES Act. Um, but that was done through the ESG system, which to date has not allocated more than $300 million in a single year. So asking a program that's set up to, to sort of send out $300 million to all of a sudden take $100 billion and efficiently distribute it is a really tall ask, but just she's exactly right to pinpoint this as a problem and overall is, you know, obviously really encouraged by that uh, proposal. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask you, Ben, hopefully this is fair to um, give us some insight, given your recent role as, you know, former senior advisor to the Biden campaign. Given the evidence that's, you know, in these papers and, and, the, and your read on it, is there evidence here that you think bolsters the support for some of the priorities that have been sig signaled by the Biden team? And I'll be really direct. Is there stuff in here? This is a leading question. So, you know, I have my own personal answer. Is there stuff in here that maybe contradicts some of their focus? Um, perhaps on policies that would support higher income middle class individuals, right? And, and a follow up to that is, uh, given what's in Adam's paper, how do you think about the pre-specified commitment, if I can call it that, of the campaign to not tax people under 400,000, given all of the ambitious goals? like fighting climate change, which we'll be talking about on the next panel, shoring up the economic security of the middle class, investing more in infrastructure. Um, I'll, I'll turn that over to, to you to put it in that context. Yes, great question. And let me just say explicitly, I'm representing my own views and not that of the Biden campaign or the Biden administration. It's really important for me to emphasize that. But um, I don't think, I don't think it, it, it necessarily conflicts. I mean, none of the authors today would dispute the notion that income inequality is rising incredibly quickly. Um, so the fact of answering your last question first, the fact that the Biden campaign committed to not raising taxes on anyone making less than $400,000 um, doesn't necessarily, you know, that's, that's where the money is. And I think that all of the authors, it's my assumption, would, would agree with that, that the growth at the very top suggests that that's the group that's best positioned to, uh, to pay for some of these initiatives. And I should say too, that it wasn't as, as though if you look at the distributional tables coming out of, for example, Penn Wharton, that it wasn't as though people making four to $500,000 were the ones who were asked to pay the most. In fact, if you believe uh, Penn Wharton, those making between roughly 400 and 800,000 would see their average tax rate go from about 28 to 28.5%. So you're not seeing those really big increases in tax rates um, that, you know, honestly, that the, the Trump campaign was, was claiming. Um, as far as, you know, other points go, if you look at the Biden agenda, and it was an incredibly sweeping agenda during the campaign, uh, I think there's a lot in there that actually agrees with this. I mean, Adam brought up the point of this big growth and transfer. Well, the Biden campaign, a central part of that was to sort of, um, I want to think of a better word, but I can't, reimagine or just recommit to the public goods, which we've seen public goods spending over time. I mean, it's own, public goods spending is almost dead. That's where we are. The, the transfers, as Adam pointed out, have made up such a large portion of uh, federal spending that things like infrastructure and uh, criminal justice and everything else we sort of consider to be public goods are pretty much just gone to zero. The Biden campaign committed to changing that. So you saw this big increase in renewable energy, a $1 trillion infrastructure plan, um, $400 billion for research, just sort of a recommitment to the public good. The second point is that, um, you know, I think that that costs were the, the rise in costs, and Bruce points this out in his paper, the rise in costs are part of, you know, the middle class well-being. And so major portions of the Biden plan gets at reducing middle class costs. So there was a $10,000 first time home buyer tax credit uh, capping health and premiums at 8.5% of income, 
um, uh, massive increases in childcare subsidies for those not just at the bottom, but an eight thousand dollar per person uh, subsidy. So, so this I'll say this and then stop, which is that the Biden plan definitely gets at costs, not just incomes. Thank you. I'm gonna let the panelists respond to some of the things you've brought up. But in doing that, Bruce, I want to pick up on something that Ben said explicitly about your paper about the um, essential spending and non-essential spending. And we had a question in Q&A that asked to a very like clarifying question about could some of what you're seeing about why consumption is going up for the middle class be simply because they're spending more on college or healthcare, even if they're not actually getting more consumption out of that. Yes, that, that's exactly, I'm glad that, that you raised that because that's that's completely right. I didn't, in the chart that I showed, I didn't adjust, I didn't try to pull out uh, the cost of their housing um, or the cost they were spending on tuition. Um, there is good news on tuition, which is that if you're attending a private university or two-year public, um, the net cost of attending four-year privates has gone down. Four-year publics are a huge part of the market, and states haven't been able to support education the way they wanted to. Hence, uh, and so you've seen uh, you've seen a real movement away from the commitment to four-year public education because states can't afford it, given all their other stuff. But I think that's a very those are completely valid points. Um, do you want me to keep talking about uh, yeah, Ben? Sure. Go uh, ahead and respond to some of the things. Thing I wanted to add to what Ben said is that a lot of what he's talking about is growth because. It's no longer, you know, Ben didn't frame it as, well, gee, you know, the rich have got too much and we got to, you know, we got to move more of the income. It's more like we want people overall to, uh, you know, have a higher probability or have a higher multiple of what their parents had, right? And that's, and, and so really um, a lot of what we're talking about on this panel is growth. And I think that we had uh, in the pre, if you call the pre-period before 1980, we had, a, we had some serious tailwinds that were helping us, right? We had the, 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 the smarter, more capable half of Americans were entering the labor force and giving us a lot of income growth and a lot of productivity growth. And we were also still heavily in the business of manufacturing stuff where um, you know, automation could, um, automation rearranging of, of workflows could really give us leaps and bounds in productivity growth. And now a good chunk uh, a chunk of the economy is in stuff where those gains, um, you know, healthcare where those gains are a bit harder to find. So I think that could be a factor. I certainly don't want to give up on growth because I think he's, uh, um, I think that that Biden is outlining a pro-growth agenda. I think the last five administrations have, have thought about growth a lot. So I think that is kind of the key. I'm, I'm glad you highlighted that because I think that's sort of underlying a lot of what we're talking about and in, in the papers, but we hadn't explicitly noted that there's there's the issue of growth everybody gets more and then it gets distributed and a lot of what we've been focused on was the distribution so i'm glad you brought that up and i think we see that in adam some of your charts in particular we see that the market incomes of the middle class haven't kept up with overall income growth which is partly you know to, to use the way ben phrased it why there's a sense of anxiety even if the government is transferring more or taxing less I, I think that's totally right. And and I, I, I do think it's important to differentiate between, you know, the question of uh, who should pay for public goods and, and who should benefit from uh, transfer programs. You know, could we have a more progressive tax system? Could we have a more effective um, safety net um, from a question of how is the how are middle class living standards going to rise in the future? And I think that that latter question is a much, you know, broader, I feel like there are, there are many more avenues to explore than, you know, just trying to cut their, their taxes or pay for their health insurance. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that they range from improving the, the quality of the environment and addressing climate change, the, you know, improving the justice under our criminal justice system, um, you know, improving the, the efficiency of our healthcare system so people get more value out of uh, the things they pay for. So I, I think that there is a much, and then of course, long-term investments in, that enhance the productivity of the workforce. Like, um, a, so I, I feel like there's a lot more that we can do to improve middle-class well-being that, that is outside of the kind of direct tax and transfer sphere. That's right. Kathy, I'm gonna let you respond too, but I want to also read you a question that's come in in Q&A. Um, and the question is, 
for you, is the need uniform throughout the country or located in particular areas such as urban neighborhoods? And if located in urban neighborhoods, would the program have unique multiplier effects? And, and I wanna also use that opportunity to highlight that there is a whole section of the book um, on geographic disparities in place-based policies that we just didn't have time for on this webinar. So again, I encourage everyone to, to look at the book and engage with all the chapters. Um, so with that, Kathy, I'll put- Perfect. I'm actually gonna to try to do three things, so this may be unfair, but um, I think if we had another hour, since as Ben said, everybody agrees that inequality has been growing, you could imagine casting well-crafted transfer policies to deal with that inequality, the growth in inequality that itself is a growth strategy for the nation, right? So they're, they're not necessarily um, in conflict. And one thing that we're thinking about in our housing policy is if you move upstream to a very, from a very costly event, it could be cost effective if you spend the money in a different way. And so it doesn't have to be zero sum on thinking about um, things that are even cast as transfers. Um, in terms of whether there are pockets of the country, um, there certainly are very, very large differences in the cost of housing. But interestingly, and Bruce, you asked part of this question yesterday, there are also differences in growth and income and affordability is about both of those. So it's not just a coastal problem and it's not just an urban problem, but the extent to which the housing cost versus very stagnant incomes comes into play differs across the country. So it is sadly much more uniform, um, but the, the notion that there are multiplier effects, I think goes back to the point I was just making, which is keeping people, keeping people stably housed can stop some other public cost in a way that can matter tremendously. And we're seeing this now as we're seeing the cascading effects from the pandemic. Great, okay, here's a question for the panelists from Nick Newman, Rick Newman from Yahoo Finance. Um, what one, or maybe two, he says three, but I'm gonna cap you at two, policies could best address the problems we're discussing? And he asks that you focus on policies that might be politically doable. Bruce, I'll start with you. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question, Rick. Good stuff. So I'm going to, uh, my answers might seem a little trite, but um, they do have the advantage of being true. Um, probably the best policy we have, I mean, clearly what we want to create is a very hot labor market. That's where we've got jobs chasing after workers. Um, I think the best policy is to continue to help match up uh, young people with human capital growth uh, investments that are that'll enable them to earn a high wage that's probably the, the very best policy and so that doesn't mean that that doesn't limit them to uh, simply going to college or getting any college degree but rather thinking very carefully about what skills are going to benefit them um, I think you could pair that with uh, an increase in the minimum wage I think those things could go hand in hand um, so that those are my two answers Adam well, I guess the, you know one one lesson from from our paper is that, um, or my impression at least, is that uh, the tax and transfer system is not the the right tool for the middle class. I, I feel like it is one of for for addressing issues in the tails of the distribution um, and not in the middle. And so I, I you know I, I guess my instinct is to agree with Bruce that that. Uh, investments that increase the productivity of uh, of workers are the closest to a free lunch we can get, um, you know, to the extent that they boost wages and uh, uh, improve their uh, their standard of living. And and I guess I would say beyond that, I I am concerned that there are a lot of inefficiencies in our um, in our education and our health um, and other areas where we just don't get enough value. And so if there were ways to, to, to squeeze uh, value out of uh, health, uh, improve affordability and improve value in, in housing markets and in, um, in health and education, I think that would go a long way to, to improving living standards. Okay, since you both brought up human capital and education, does that lead to free college or debt forgiveness? 
Well, I mean, so this is an issue I've been, you know, closely engaged with, and and I, you know, my concern here is that is that there are real trade offs involved in, um, you know, what the federal government pays for and, and who benefits from that, uh, and so policies like free college and and uh, another thing I've been engaged with, student debt relief, you know, those are policies that are uh, large in scale and whose beneficiaries are largely uh, upper middle class uh, households. Uh, and to put that in perspective, uh, for giving you know, student, students owe about $1.6 trillion in federal student debt. Uh, if we forgave that all, uh, how much is that? Well, you know, for perspective, uh, that's more than we've ever spent on the earned income tax credit uh, since the earned income tax credit was enacted in 1975. Uh, the EITC is a policy that almost entirely benefits low-income working parents with children. Um, and, and, you know, just thinking about um, housing, uh, $1.6 trillion is about equal to the total amount that we spend on uh, rental assistance since 1962. Uh, so it's, you know, just an enormous sum of money. Um, and we seem to, to enormous sum of money and also focused on a group that's relatively advantaged compared to um, people who need re uh, rental assistance or um, or people who are struggling uh, at low low wage jobs and have kids. Yeah, we can't have a conversation as a bunch of economists and not emphasize the issue of trade offs, which is right. okay. If we give one point six trillion dollars in funding to this, we are not expanding wage subsidies for low income households or you know expanding our rental programs. Um, Kathy, I'll, I'll give it to you now. You've highlighted a specific policy proposal already, but I would be interested I'll take in- an, I'll yeah. propose another one, and I'm not gonna stay within the politically viable because I think a point that Adam was just making is we wanna change the cost structure. The big gain is not just moving money around unless it changes something else. And we need to, we need to lower the cost of creating housing. We can't just spend more money on it and uh, federal levers aren't great on this, but I think you could use federal levers to really move the states. And states have big levers on this in terms of decreasing the local barriers uh, to housing. They're halfway aligned with the federal government because they bear some of these costs of the lack of mobility. And, the, and, and this matters for everybody across the spectrum. Um, and there's a lot of good work suggesting the drag on the labor markets of not having freely, easily mobile labor is also part of what's driving inequality. And so I would suggest for a bold federal initiative from an incoming administration to think about ways to leverage states to decrease the local cost of creating housing. Great, thank you. Ben, what's your favorite policy? So Bruce and Adam both brought up human capital and I, can and should be kicked out of economics if I disagreed. But I think that that's got to be paired with uh, sort of a rebalancing of the labor market. So this doesn't mean just more union density, but also uh, less employer concentration in local labor markets, um, rethinking international pressures. Uh, Melissa, you've written a ton on this, uh, but also labor market policies like non-competes and manager arbitration, which lessen work worker power. So I think those should be paired. The second thing is I think we've got to think really hard about wealth building strategies. Yes. The way we subsidize retirement is, um, it, is just so backwards um, and unequal. The bulk of, of the roughly $250, $300 billion in tax subsidies for retirement go to the top quintile. Um, it would never be designed this way if it was done more intentionally. Homeownership subsidies almost all go towards the upper income, especially post TCJA when itemization has uh, been undercut. Um, so I think we've got to rethink wealth building strategies. I mean, even just in this current market where you've seen the stock market go through the roof while everyone else was struggling, uh, having more people invest in the stock market would go a long way towards easing middle class anxieties. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead, Bruce. No, I just wanted to tack on to what Ben said, which is that, of course, the primary asset that most middle class families own is their home. And there's a massive black white gap in home ownership. And this is, of course, then it making it much more difficult to pass wealth along to your child, either for their own, you know, uh, uh, living or for them to found a business or what have you. So, you know, clearly, 
you know, there's a, there's a, there's a potential win um, somewhere in there. Great, thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm watching anxiously the time tick away. Um, so here's one on, uh, I'm gonna throw this one to Adam and Ben, if you could answer quickly. What are the specific tax policy actions that incoming administration can do on its own, i.e. without Congress, to combat inequality and other issues highlighted by these papers? Adam, you want to take it? Uh, yeah, I mean, so what can they do without legislation? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're more limited in that role. And so you, I think that there's two, two things you can do. One is, um, you know, issue regulations that clarify elements of the law. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can change how you operate um, the IRS. And so on those two dimensions, I think there's there are things that they can do. Uh, I mean, on the first, I think that there are the regulations imposed um, after the Tax Cuts and Job Act were uh, excessively generous to, um, you know, large corporations, uh, multinational corporations. Uh, likewise, I think that there are, there are uh, regulations one could propose for things like estate taxes and um, uh, other um, uh, closely held businesses that could uh, uh, raise taxes on those groups. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, I think that, that uh, we could do a much better job of making sure people who are entitled to uh, credits like the Earned Income Tax Credit, the American Opportunity Tax Credit, the Child Tax Credit, uh, are able to access those credits and get them when they're entitled to them. Uh, and uh, on the IRS side, that they are not audited at um, uh, excessive rates or denied uh, their credits because they're um, um, you know, a lot of people are denied uh, denied the ATC through correspondence audits where there's not actually a verification that they were um, um, ineligible. Only only uh, the only information was that they didn't answer their mail. Um, and so I, I think that there are, um, you know, there are things that are probably fairly impactful that that the administration can do that improve the distribution of taxes and make sure that tax law is carried out in a more fair and transparent way. Yeah, so an emphatic yes to what Adam just said. Uh, and just to put a finer point on the tax compliance point, I mean, during the campaign, we thought we could raise a little over a trillion dollars over 10 years by improving tax compliance. So you just brought up trade-offs. I mean, one of the easiest trade-offs is to ask people who are willingly not paying their taxes to actually pay their taxes. I mean, Someone should do the, the math on this. I, I'm reasonably confident that if we, if everyone paid their, uh, the taxes that were owed, we would not have public debt today, right? I mean, it is a massive problem. It, it uh, crowds out lots of other public investment, crowds out lots of other private investment. Uh, so I think that that's, that's sort of low hanging fruit, which is just improving tax compliance. I think even the Trump administration in their last budget called for more money for the IRS. So um, I agree with Adam and, and tax compliance is certainly something that any administration can do. Thank you. Um, okay, so there's a there's a question from the crowd that says, uh, any views on Medicare for all? So I will just point out to those of you uh, watching this webinar, we don't have a chapter on Medicare for all in this year's policy volume, but in last year's policy volume, we have a chapter on Medicare for all by the healthcare public finance economist, Craig Garthwaite. Um, so I encourage you all when you're going to the website to download this year's policy volume, download last year's and even the years before that as well. The topics are all still relevant. And they take on a lot of the issues we've talked about today. Medicare, your question about Medicare for all universal basic income, also ways to increase human capital and directly um, think about fighting income inequality. Um, but if anyone wants to take a minute to share your views on Medicare for all, feel free. Anyone? See, so, so then I will re-spin that to say, what other sort of like rapid fire last minute for each of you is there another sort of policy point you think that's important to make in this wide ranging conversation that either doesn't get enough attention or perhaps you think we should redirect from something that does get too much attention? Um, or another way for me to ask a question is, given the current pandemic, has that shifted your views at all 
about what our policy priorities need to be to secure economic security for more Americans. We'll go in the order you started. We're down to less than a minute per person, Bruce. So I think one takeaway, something that we already knew from the financial crisis is that, you know, everybody becomes pro-government in a crisis like this. And I think a key takeaway is that it's so important that the, we have this federal government that can be a backstop, that can provide um, unemployment insurance subsidies, rental subsidies, and uh, cash assistance to people. Um, and it has played that role up to a point, and it's it's done that re relatively well. And so I think that, that's a key takeaway from the crisis. Adam? I mean, I, another observation is I, I wish that we had more automatic stabilizers that, that kicked in when this started um, so we didn't have to, you know, go through the a legislative process to to expand unemployment insurance or to address some of these losses in income. Uh, you know, right now we're in this protracted negotiation where where people I think are, you know, suffering today uh, because legislators can't agree on that. And so I, I wish that as soon as we enter a period of normalcy, we can enact uh, something that says the next time this happens, um, we'll have unemployment insurance, we'll have, uh, you know, other enhancements. Uh, that would cost nothing because we never forecast recessions. Um, um, so, uh, you know, it'd be easy. I like to think it'd be easy to, easy to uh, it wouldn't cost anything. Right, great, thanks. I'd say the exact same thing, fix it forward. There are a whole bunch of lessons from right now that we should take the moment when we're not in a crisis to build what we want that to be in the future. You can't build it while it's happening. Great, thank you, and Ben. Uh, I wish I could give a different answer, but they're right on. I mean, our unemployment insurance system is using 40 year old software and it's not just a matter of more dollars. I mean, these are common sense things. Three times during the Obama administration, we tried to modernize UI. We knew this was coming. We have a terrible system in place for widespread small business shortages. Um, uh, Cobra, we've got to think harder about health insurance for people who leave jo lose jobs. Right now, it is mid-December, and, and in a couple of weeks, 12 million people will, use, will, will lose their unemployment insurance benefits unless Congress acts. That's a terrible system. It's an awful system. So a strong yes, but it's not just about more dollars, but it's also about a better implementation of existing systems. Terrific. Um, you guys are great. Thank you all so much for being with us. Thanks to our audience for joining us. And next up, we're going to talk about climate change. So I turn this over to ESG co-chair and former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson.